Yes, I do live in Nashville, Tennessee, which is in the United States of America. But in the year 2000, I moved to Denmark for a year. And I lived here from the middle of 2000 to the middle of 2001. And the day after, no, the day before, the day before I moved here, a bridge between Sweden and Denmark opened. Everyone was so happy. <coughs> Yesterday I rode the train to Sweden and I heard the voice say, be sure you have your passport ready for border control. And I thought, oh my goodness, the United States has elected a misogynist, racist bigot for president. And you have border control. What is happening? What is happening? So this is a talk about experiments, and if you enjoy it and you think it's worthwhile, you might wonder at the end, oh, maybe someone from my organization or my family, oh, I wish they had been here. They could have heard this awesome talk and they could see some new ideas about experiments. Too bad they weren't here. So as most of you know, I give away my presentations. There is no copyright on any of these slides. And you've got my email address there. I'd be happy to not just send you the PDF, but the PowerPoint so that you can change it up, you can rewrite it and put it in Danish or whatever you want to do with it as yours. And if you think it's worthwhile, then you can share all of that information. And as Christian mentioned, we are not going to have time for questions at the end, but please, you can email them to me or you can use the app to ask questions and I will get back to you, I promise, with any question that you might have. So it's Linda at lindarising.org. So let's take a survey. How many of you are doing Agile something? Oh, sure. Okay, most of you are doing Agile something. And how did you decide to do that? How did you make that decision? Anybody? You don't know? You don't remember? Just do it. Oh, somebody told you to do it. Do you suppose at any point in that decision making change there was an examination of any science? Did anyone look at the randomized controlled experiments that show clearly, that provide scientific evidence that Agile is better than what you were doing before? How many of you looked at all of those did you? <laughs> because I have not seen any. I have not seen a single one. I'm waiting. I expect that I am setting myself up for disappointment because it takes a lot of energy, time, and money. We barely can scrape by doing a project, let alone a copy of it using another process so that we could compare the results and show that clearly Agile is better. Well, you know, it's not just about Agile. We've been doing this forever. I have been in software development for, oh my goodness, a long time. In fact, this year I had a terrible birthday. I know some of you don't know me are looking carefully under the spotlight and saying, good Lord, how old is this woman? <laughs> so it wasn't a round birthday. I remember those from my time in Denmark, a round birthday. That's very important. And you must have a big party and invite all your friends. No, no, it was sort of midway between two round birthdays. This year, I became 75. 
Thank you. So as you might imagine, I have seen a lot of change in our industry. And it seems to me that we have not destroyed the pattern of just jumping on the latest bandwagon, that our decisions do not involve any science, that we never look for evidence, that we don't do real experiments. Instead, we tell each other stories. Stories are powerful. It's the most influential way we have of passing along information. In fact, stories are much more powerful than evidence. Stories are much more convincing than facts will ever be. So we hear those stories and we think, ah, we should also use Agile. We felt the same about a lot of other approaches to process and tools and programming languages. It's the way we are. Well, I know people use the word experiment, but they're really not experimenting. Think about it. All of you are educated. You had an encounter at some point with the scientific method. A scientific method does involve experiments. And there we talk about some kind of hypothesis that we're going to test. And some kind of experiment that involves randomization and a control group, as well as the treatment itself. And then we observe the experiment and do some analysis, looking for statistical significance to validate our hypothesis or not, and we don't even begin to do something like that. I would like to suggest that instead of the word experiment, we use the word try, because that's really what we're doing. When we say, well, let's experiment, we really mean, let's just try it. And we will never be able to afford real science in helping us make our decisions. We don't have a clear hypothesis in the beginning. We just have something we'd like to try. Well, let's just try it. There isn't any randomization. Usually when we suggest we might try something, the people who say, oh, me, me, I want to try that, those people are already sold. They're enthusiastic about it, and they will make it happen. We know that's true even in real scientific experiments, that if the experimenter has a bias toward a result, it's much more likely that that's the result that he or she will get. And, of course, there's no control group. It's just, I think we used to be able to do this, and then we have no data, of course, for comparison. We kind of remember the way things were, and we say, oh, it seems so much better now. Oh, uh, we feel better about it. I hear that argument for Agile all the time. We feel better about Agile. I'm not sure how scientific that is. Some companies do something called A-B testing, and I think they are delusional, believing that that is also science when really all they're doing is trying something. And they can learn a little bit in an A-B test, and we know we are the victims of A-B tests constantly if we're online, and they are learning something about us, but most of it does not force out some kind of theory. There's no theory building going on, it's just this seems to work better than that. And in fact, given the context, all we can really say is, this works better than that here and now with the users that we have. Very context sensitive. It could change tomorrow. And we never usually have some explanation that makes any scientific sense. We might make it up, but there is no theory building. So let's just say trial. Let's just be honest, and let's talk about trials. And let's be honest and transparent and say, we'll never be scientific about this. We don't have the resources usually for the projects we run, let alone for a randomized 
trial or experiment with a control group. We can't afford it, so let's just use a nice pattern from Fearless Change. It's called trial run, and we will use the word trial instead of experiment. So why should we do these? I often get this answer. Ah, Linda, we are going to do some experiments or trials because we will prove. We will have proof that the idea that we have or the notion or the thing that we want to try, ah, this really works here. So one thing we know clearly is that even in a real scientific setting, if you had real results from a single experiment, a single experiment never proves anything. It's only the first step in a long process that involves repeated validation. Your experiment needs to be done by someone else if it's really going to be scientific proof. And even then, it's tenuous. You needed repeated validations. Uh, the other problem is that people often don't believe it. If they don't believe in your result before the trial, after the trial, they're still often not convinced. So let's not do it for the sake of feeling that we're going to prove something. What we know is that all of us are biased, and that the results of all drug trials, if those participating in it knew who's getting the real drug and who's not, that they themselves, the researchers or the physicians running the trials, were able to sway the results by their bias. Their enthusiasm, their belief can alter the outcome. And of course, it wasn't until the 1950s that we uncovered something even stranger about drug trials, even though they are run in an experimental setting. That is, there is a treatment group and there is a control group. There's randomized assignment to the different groups. But they began to study the results and found that after a while, the real drug seemed to lose its efficacy. We proved in a scientific trial that it should work in the treatment of this disease, but over time, we track. The efficacy decreases. What is going on here? And finally, someone realized that, you know, people in a drug trial, given a drug of any kind, are going to get better just because they got some attention and a chance to try a drug. So they said, we need another group. We're going to introduce a group in the middle, in addition to the control and the treatment. We're going to have another group where people get what looks like the real treatment. They'll get a, a drug an injection, surgery, it will be a sham surgery, it will be a sugar pill, it will be saline, an injection, it will look like the real treatment, but it has no power to cure the illness. And what they found was astounding, that people in this middle group got better. In fact, usually about two-thirds. So it can't be that your drug is better than nothing. It has to be that your drug is better than, what's that middle group called? Yeah, it's not really English even, so I don't know whether it's a Danish translation, it's Latin, placebo. Placebo, how does that work? How can somebody take a sugar pill or saline injection or go through sham surgery and get better? How can that happen? Why? Hello? Hello? What do you think? Yeah, because y you believe in it. You think that you are getting the real drug. And so your belief is enough to make it happen. I have a talk, the title of which is, Is Agile a Placebo? I, 
I don't often get a request for the talk. <laughs> Is that a bad thing? If Agile is a placebo, is that a bad thing? It just means that we can affect the outcome by our belief, and if we believe in it, we can make it happen. Is that a bad thing? Given that we have no science to back up our decisions, can we run our industry on belief? Does that sound like religion to you? <laughs> so what can we do? What can we do? Well, we're going to use the word trial, so you know we're not really doing experiments. And we can do a lot of little tiny trials. So small, simple, fast, and frugal. And change it up. Don't just let the most enthusiastic people get involved in the trials. Let lots of people try it. Let lots of people be involved in these small, tiny, fast, frugal experiments and keep running them over and over again. They should be as small as possible. That's the question you should constantly ask yourself because if they are small, then you're not as afraid that things might not go as well as you like. And in fact, we often, when we talk about experiments or even trials, we use the F word. So I'm suggesting we get rid of it. Let's not even say failure or something. Okay, I said it, but that's it. We're not going to talk about failure. And the reason for that is simple. I won't ask you to raise your hands, but managers and executives do not like to talk about failure. And so they are not going to be open to your ideas for experiments or trials. They're reluctant to take even a small risk. So let's instead talk about we're going to learn we're going to do a small and simple, fast and frugal little trial so that we can learn whether this works for us. We're going to learn something. So it's not that we will succeed if it works and we will fail if it doesn't. No, we will learn. It's all about learning something. Learning something about the idea, learning something about our organization, learning something about our team. We're going to learn, and so therefore we will get better. Keep it small. Keep it simple. You want everyone in the organization to feel that, well, I could even come up with an idea. I, I could think of an idea for a trial. I, I'm not a scientist. I don't have a lot of time. But there is something I've been wondering about. There's a question I have. Maybe we could have a little, small, simple, fast and frugal trial. I could come up with an idea. You want to encourage everyone to participate in this exercise and always ask, can we make it even simpler? I'm going to read this to you. It's a quote from someone I believe runs the most agile company on the planet. It is Menlo Innovations. It's located in Ann Arbor, Michigan. The CEO is Rich Sheridan. How many of you know Rich or have heard him? Okay. Two and a half people. Thank you very much. Okay. He's written an awesome book called Joy, which everyone should read. Establish a standard, a fast frequent and inexpensive experimentation. Assume that many of your experiments will fail. Well, see, he's the CEO, so he can say fail. One of the most common phrases you'll hear at Menlo is, let's run the experiment. We are apt to say that at least once a day. Now, we don't track them. We don't count the experiments. We don't track success or failure rates. But if we did, we would look for success and failure rates to be about even. 
If the percentage of failures started dropping, we'd become concerned that fear had crept into the room and that people were not taking enough risk. So fast, do it quickly. Why frugal? Frugal means cheap because we are susceptible to a, one, only one of many incredible biases called the sunk cost fallacy. Now, I don't know about you, but I have been in many meetings that go something like this. Oh, let's look at Project X. I think it's not doing well. Yes, you're right. It's not doing well, but we've already spent a million dollars. Let's give it another six months. How about six months? Everyone, raise your hands. Yes, okay, six months. Six months later, you know, Project X, still not doing very well. Yes, you're right. But we've already spent two million dollars. We can't stop now. Let's give them another six months. Do you see where this is going? You're smart people. Yeah. <laughs> Have you been in a meeting like that? Yes. Finally, Project X is not doing so well. Oh, you're right. And since we have already spent $30 million, it has been running now for two and a half years and has produced nothing. Maybe we should cancel it. Or, how about this one? Well, you know, we've been married for 10 years. We have two kids. Even though we can't stand each other, we can't, I mean, you know, it's... Ah, oh, you don't know what I'm talking about. You're so young. <laughs> You're so young. Mm. So it works at many levels, and it has to do with an investment, an investment of time, investment energy, money, resources of some sort. And once we've done that, we are so loss-averse. We feel much more pain at loss than we do joy at gain. And so the sunk cost fallacy always traps us. So here's a little suggestion for making any kind of decision, whether you want to cancel a project or end a relationship. Ignore, ignore the sunk costs. They are gone. Make your decision based on what you have learned up to this point. Yes, part of that is the money, the time, the resources that you've invested. But don't ever bring that to the table. It's what do we know now about what we have based on our experience and use that to guide your decision, not the amount of money or the amount of time that you have invested. So that's not just me, that's general decision-making advice from people who study that. Sunk costs color your decisions and they make them bad. You want your decisions to be better so that's one thing that you can do. And if your experiments are cheap, then when you look at the results, you're going to be more open, you're going to be more accepting of what happened, and you're going to be more able to learn if you ignore sunk costs. So always ask, can we make it even cheaper? I also want to add one more thing to those experiments. They should be time boxed. I see a lot of trials or experiments in organizations that somehow just keep running. They don't die. And so it's very hard to determine whether they have been successful at showing anything or not because those proponents of the experiment or the trial are reluctant to call a halt until they absolutely have convinced themselves that it was worthwhile. So make them very small, make them very simple, make them fast, make them frugal, and put a time box. Let's try having the stand up at 10 a.m. instead of 8 a.m. for the next two weeks. 
And then what are you going to measure? What will determine what you have learned? And then let's see if attendance is better and if we get more done in the morning. That's a very simple thing. It's simple, fast, frugal, easy. So why should we do these trials to show those people, those other people? Mm. So we will talk later about something called the confirmation bias and the backfire effect, which shows clearly there's a lot of evidence that even though we are faced with real scientific results, we are not ready to move from any conclusion where we previously have an opinion when we really care. So a trial is not going to do that. Even real scientific experiments are not going to do that. It's better to use some nice patterns that I can offer you from Fearless Change to move people in a given direction. Why not invite them to do the trials or experiments with you? The pattern is called Involve Everyone. Let everyone feel free to participate. If you're trying to do an agile transformation, introduce it as a series of small trials. Let everyone run their own small trials, not just some pilot project. There is no pattern named pilot project, and there's a good reason for that. And then when you have results from your small, simple, fast, and frugal. Share those in stories. Remember, we started this discussion by saying stories are much more convincing than facts. So involve others and share stories much better than thinking that you're going to overwhelm people with evidence from your small trials. We also somehow believe that if we do some kind of experiment or trial, that it will address some large issue that we have. It's going to help us solve a problem. And what we know now about you and your organization is that you are complex adaptive systems. And while there is no science in software development, there is science in complex adaptive systems theory. And it says you cannot wholesale pick up an organization and move it down the road so that you can say we will all be agile by next July. It can't be done. All you can do is small, little, tiny experiments and then stand back and watch and look at the behavior of the complex adaptive system and on the basis of that behavior you can make another little trial, stand back, observe, do another trial and so on. I'd be happy to send you this paper. It was written by Joseph Pellrine on understanding software agility, a software, a social complexity point of view, where he talks about software development as a complex adaptive system. And what we know is the only way to make any change in it is to go through these three steps. Probe it, sense, respond. A little trial. Watch what happens. On the basis of that, do another small trial. So give it up. You're not going to make the organization take big giant steps in any direction. But your best hope is little tiny trials that affect everything. Every little thing you do changes everything ultimately. And watch for more ideas for more small trials. Because you don't know what's going to happen. I'm not a fan of Donald Rumsfeld, but he said, we don't know what we don't know. Brilliant. And that's true. That's true. So you can't proceed any sort of agile transformation with any assurance that you're going to be there by next July or not. You have no clue. Nobody should expect that. And there's always going to be a little surprise. Anybody know who Alexander Fleming is? You are probably alive because 
of his surprise. He didn't come into his lab prepared to make an earth-shattering discovery. He had been on a long holiday, and he wasn't very neat. He was kind of a messy guy. And so when he got back, he saw piles and piles of things on his lab bench, and he started saying, well, I guess I better clean this up. It's a real mess here. And then he noticed a couple of Petri dishes. Gee, that's funny. I had been growing a particular kind of bacterium, and there's a hole in the middle Something killed my experiment. Something killed these bacteria. I wonder if it's this leftover sandwich from lunch that got in the wrong pile. And So he didn't come in saying, I am going to discover penicillin. It was an accident because he was so sloppy. But he was observant. And he was prepared to be surprised. So you don't know what's going to happen. You don't know when that latest small trial, that simple, easy, fast and fruit is going to change everything. Gee, that's funny. I didn't expect that. My second nomination for the most agile company on the planet is in Dusseldorf, Germany, and it's a company called Sipgate. And they do something called Open Friday. And on Open Friday, they bring in oh, ideas for little trials. And they do lots of little experiments all the time. And when the results come along, they say something like, we weren't even trying for that. The results we got were so unexpected. They say that all the time. So if you're going to start doing small, simple, fast and frugal trials, be prepared. You're going to change everything. Now this one is actually valid. This is a valid reason for doing trials. Because if you have anything anything worthwhile, some positive result. We did a little trial. We found the customer was happy with, or we found that we were able to do this faster, or we did a little experiment and we learned that our team, all of those things are valuable. Management would love to hear them. The problem is if we don't go in with the right approach to management, and I've got a list for you, Remember, you're going to ask for the slide so you will have it. Make sure that it's easy to understand. That does not mean that managers are stupid. Well, actually, maybe they are stupid. I mean, no, it means they don't have any time. They don't have any time to listen. I was in Sweden a couple of days before coming here talking to a big company that starts with E. And the fellow I was working with said, I'm going to get ready for my management presentation. I have 40 slides of data. <laughs> 40 slides of data. I said, I think you could pare that down. Could you do it in 20 slides? Oh, no. Could you do it in 10? How about two? Take the most important message that you have. Make the summary easy to understand. Do you know this is not just true of managers, it is true for all of us. If the message is difficult to understand, we think that it's complicated, probably wrong. Where if it's easy and obvious, we tend to believe it. We are much more influenced by simple, easy to understand things. This is what you want them to say. Why haven't we thought of this? in that way before. Keep that in the back of your mind when you're putting together the results of your small, simple, fast and frugal trials. Yes, share that with management. Yes, make it so easy and so obvious that they are going to open their arms and say, yes, why haven't we been doing this all along? It's so obvious. 
a nice quote from a guy at Shuttersock who said, if you do trials, you kill off the hippos, the highest paid person's opinion. Testing is a way to get to the bottom of any decision without relying on anyone's gut instinct at Shuttersock. If a senior executive has an idea, the response is, well, let's try it. Let's test it. No one has any more influence than anyone else. There is no largest out. The guy in the room who's loudest and the highest ranking has no more influence over the decision. It is always about, well, let's do the little experiment. It changes everything. Organizations that have adopted this approach find that now instead of endless ranting and raving and meetings, the suggestion is always, well, why don't we just test it? Why don't we run a little simple experiment? Instead of arguing and debating, bringing in 40 pages of slides, let's just try it. Let's see if it will work for us. We know that we're subject to the confirmation bias. It's the worst bias we have. It's when we believe anything, that when we see new information, we filter it out. Even if it's scientific evidence, we are not convinced. And we all do this. It's the biggest problem we face in the United States. I know you think it's Donald Trump. No, it isn't. It's the fact that we are incredibly divided at the moment, just right down the middle. And nobody listens to anybody. We're not talking. And even if faced with facts about the other side's point of view, we will refuse to listen. It's amazing how quickly that happened. You say, well, this is a very strong bias in us. In fact, my favorite experiment has to do with two groups of contentious people who looked at the same set of evidence, the same data, the same results, and both sides said, yes, we have looked at this data, and in the face of this evidence, we can see that clearly this evidence supports my point of view. And that both sides can say that, having looked at the same evidence, the same data. And we wonder, well, how could that happen? And the answer is clear. Even looking at scientific evidence, if we don't like it, we will discount it. And we will say, oh, look at this study. It was done at MIT. We know they don't know what they're doing. So we can just ignore that. Oh, oh, or this other experiment, well, it was so poorly done, they only had a very small sample size. Well, we don't have to pay attention to that. And we will find some way around it. We will find some way of ignoring it. We hate to give up that belief, especially if we've had it for a long time, and especially if we are part of what's called a moral tribe. I like this quote from Warren Buffett who said, you know, Charles Darwin knew about this, even ahead of all the research in cognitive neuroscience. And he said whenever he ran into something that contradicted a notion that he cherished, he wrote it down right away. Because he knew his mind would begin to try to convince him that it was something he could just ignore. Man's natural inclination is to cling to his beliefs, particularly if they are reinforced by recent experience. Thank you, Warren Buffett. So we don't see clearly. We don't even look at the results of scientific experiments clearly because they are seen through the glasses that distort everything. It's the set of our own beliefs about how the world operates. And then if you're going to do an experiment, you have to be prepared that what you hoped for is not what's going to appear. And that is also difficult. Another very strong bias in us is cognitive dissonance. We can't hold to opposing ideas at the same time. And so if we struggle to say, 
I, I, was, I was thinking that this trial would show, but it didn't. It, it showed something else instead. This is a difficult thing for us to be open to whatever the results are. Even scientists struggle with this. Even scientists will distort the results so that it fits with their prior beliefs. A favorite quote from a physicist friend of mine who said, I wish for every student that something they deeply hold to be true is shown to be wrong. Once you've had that experience, then you get it. You get what science is all about. So we have to address these biases and one thing we can do is talk out loud. We can say, you know, we are all biased. Say that out loud. You know we should be more scientific. We should be more rational. Use the word science, rational, hypothesis, theory. It actually tricks your brain into believing that you are going to be more scientific, that you are going to be more rational. Say, most people want to overcome their biases. We know that writing with a real pen on real paper, put down your ideas, track the results of your trials, putting it down on real paper helps you to be more objective. And then we heard a wonderful talk today on diversity. Have people with different points of view involved in these trials so that you can make sure someone will have a hope in hell of being objective about the results. Ah, and then always slow down. The conscious mind is slow and linear. Take a break. Get enough sleep. Ah, that's another talk. So this was an experiment that spoke to me personally. Even if we're able to do real experiments, this is a trap we cannot avoid. This was an, a longitudinal experiment. It was done over the course of 30 years. They tracked a lot of males looking for an interesting correlation of some sort. They weren't sure. They looked at coffee consumption and incidence of Parkinson's disease, a neurological disease. And they did find that those who drank the most coffee were least likely to get Parkinson's. Now you can imagine a result like that. This is a well done study, 8,004 subjects over 30 years. How many of you drink coffee? So you, right now you're saying, yes. <laughs> yes, there it is. Your bias is working favorably toward this one. But if you don't like coffee, then you're saying, oh, there must be something wrong with it. And there is. There's an interesting correlation, yes but it doesn't mean that coffee is protective of Parkinson's or any other neurological disease, sorry. Because this is my family history. We have a particular neurological disease. My father had it, my brothers have it, I have it, and my daughter has it. And none of us drink coffee. Because the genetic tendency for this particular illness also means that we do not like coffee. So it's not that those who drank coffee were protected against Parkinson's. It's those who got Parkinson's were of a genetic makeup that made it so they didn't like the taste of coffee and hence did not drink it. Do you see the significant difference? Do you see how easy it is to get caught up in inference? You run your trial and you say, look at these awesome results. It's so clear. Let's call the newspapers. Drinking five cups of coffee a day protects against Parkinson's. No, it doesn't. Got it wrong. Correlation does not mean causation. It's an enormous trap. Be careful. So, it's, I hope, enough of a good story 
And you'll remember, I have this, and it's why I don't drink coffee. That maybe it will help you be aware in the future. Watch out. Your re results might not be as potent as you think. So now, instead of spending time, wasting time, someone should say, and, and it should be you, why don't we do a small, simple, fast, and frugal little trial? It will help us address this instead of endlessly debating. And if you get in the habit of that, and others in your organization get in the habit of that. You will change everything. I often talk to people about, well, culture change. And, and the answer is, you cannot change your culture. Oh, maybe you can. But it's going to take a long time. And it's going to happen just like this. If everyone will do some small simple thing, you'll find that you become a culture of scientists, a culture of experimenters, a culture of people open, willing to take a small risk, a culture willing to learn. And that's my definition of Agile. So I have a list of recommendations for those of you who really want to get involved. And you know I like to give away books. So I have a copy here of the y-axis. So I'll just put it right here. Maybe it will disappear. Oh, it's already gone. <laughs> of course, I want you to buy Fearless Change and More Fearless Change and Joy to read about a, a culture of experimentation. But before you tell me, oh, Linda, my organization is too big. We're a bank, after all. That's what I heard yesterday. We are a bank. We have restrictions. We have rules here. We have procedures. We can't do experiments. Oh, yes, you can. Because here's the prime example. It's part of the UK government. Now, talk about conservative. Talk about restricted by rules. Come on, what could be worse than the UK government? Well, it could be the US government, I suppose. <laughs> or the Danish government, or the Swedish government. And they have a group of people whose job it is to do fast, frugal, small, simple experiments. And in the process, they learn. And in the process, they are saving the UK government a lot of money. Are you interested now? Yes. Check it out, the Behavioral Insights team. It's actually moved to become more independent now, but that's because they have been so successful. They are not just helping the UK government, they are helping governments around the world. And their approach is exactly what I have been saying today. Lots of fast, frugal, small, simple ways of addressing issues, not with the idea of tackling a big problem. For instance, how do we get people to pay taxes when they have refused up to this point? That's a big problem. No, we're not solving it, but we know a very simple way to encourage more people to do that. And I'm not going to give you the answer to that. I'm going to let you go to that website and check it out. So if the government can do it, you can do it. If they are getting awesome results, you can get awesome results. If they can be creative, you can be creative. Just try it. Start running your own trials. That's how you learn to walk. That's how you learn to talk. If you weren't a natural scientist when you were a child, you wouldn't have learned to do anything. You did lots of little simple trials. How did you learn to walk? On schedule? Did your parents come in and say, okay, you're two years old now. I think uh, we'll give you two weeks. Let's, let's start walking. No. You stood up. You fell down. You took a step. You fell down. You crawled forward and then grabbed a hold of something and then fell down. Over and over and over. Be a child. 
I think it's time for you to go home. Thanks for listening. My pleasure.